I get the pleasure and also pressure um, to, <laughs> to close out our Proverbs series. Um, before I start, I just want to do a quick recap of what has been um, touched on throughout this series so far. Um, so Sam started us off by talking um, and took us through of how we got the book of Proverbs and also how we can apply the wisdom um, to our everyday lives. Um, and Raquel came over and talked about welcoming the way of wisdom. Um, she also talked about that we should welcome God's character correction within ourselves and also God's discipline and challenges. And then Ben touched on uh, wisdom with our words and also guarding our tongues. Um, and Andrew came over and focused on wisdom in leadership. She drew, uh, he drew us back to the background story of Proverbs, um, which is King Solomon was praying and asking God for wisdom to guide him um, to um, lead his people and also di distinguish between right and wrongs. Um, and last week, Sam talked about wisdom with our staff. Um, rather than craving for more materialistic stuff um, to fulfill our self um, selfish motives, he encouraged us to give generously um, from an abundant mindset. So today, I'm going to close this series by talking about wisdom in relationship. More accurately, probably wisdom from relationship. Um, but before I start, I just want us to um, bow our head and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, this opportunity that we get to gather around in your house and hear your word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be upon me as I deliver this message to your people. Um, take hold of my tongue and guide me um, in the whole delivery process of this message. And I pray that your spirit will, um, will um, have seeds landing on fresh soils and also you will water um, the, the tree and the plant that's already there and make them grow. We just want to grow um, in deeper understanding um, um, about our relationship with you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Um, can we do a bit of study this morning? Um, I'm going to start by taking you through a brief structure of the book of Proverbs. Um, so the book of Proverbs actually consists of three parts. So the chap chapter 1 to 9 actually um, is a series of discourse materials that highlight the purpose of the book. And also it has, um, it has a father's reflection on the ways of wisdom. And the second part is chapter 10 to 29 consists of um, um, a collection of proverbs and wise sayings from King Solomon and other anonymous sources. And the third part is a, um, a short part, which is chapter 30 to 31. Um, so it has some additional sayings from Aga and King Lamel, and also an anonymous poem on ideal wife, specific wisdom for women. I really want to draw your attention to the first part, which highlights the purpose of this book. With that in mind, let's take a look at the following two scriptures. Proverbs 1.7, it says, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. And Proverbs 9.10, it says, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. So these two scriptures actually appear at the very start of this first section and the very end of this um, first section as well. So it's a book and structure. Let me tell you a trick over here. Every time you read a Bible, if you see a message appearing twice, especially when it's book ending or bracketing a whole section or a whole book, take note of this because it's trying to say to you, this is something important um, that's coming. And in fact, this is the central message of what the proverb um, is all about. So the proverb is actually telling us to appear the fear of God in our everyday lives. Both scriptures point to the fear of, um, of the Lord being the foundation or beginning of our wisdom. Um, actually, the Hebrew word used um, in this context for fear can either be expressing anything between, um, fear, um, anything between respect or um, afraid or apprehension. But the most appropriate translation for this fear is actually in awe. 
It is when we're standing in God's presence, we're in awe that He is our creator. He is the creator of the universe. He is so much bigger than who we are. And recognizing that God takes our breath away, that makes us kneel down and receive instructions and wisdom from Him. Wisdom actually has nothing to do with our IQ. It's not about our cleverness, but it stems from our obedience to God. As we stay in relationship with God, continue to be faithful to Him, and committed to continuously seeking more understanding of who He is, we receive wisdom for life, for our words, for leadership, for our finances, and for our relationships. Wisdom does not begin with accumulating facts, but it begins with our relationship with God. Living under the New Testament, as we do nowadays, um, we like to use the word relationship to describe um, between God and us. But in the Old Testament, quite often, it was a different word that used to describe this relationship. Do you guys remember which word what, um, that is? Um, it's covenant. Yeah. So New Testament, we talk about relationship a lot, but Old Testament, we use the word covenant. Um, let's do a bit of word study on covenant. So the Hebrew word for covenant is berich. Um, pardon my understanding, I tried my best. Um, um, it's berich. Uh, and also it has a sense of cutting in this word because uh, making a covenant during the Hebrew culture um, or the ancient Near East culture in the Old Testament Old Testament time, it literally involves cutting animals um, in halves. Um, so when the Old Testament was translated into the Greek Septuagint, which was the foundation of a lot of our English Bibles nowadays, the word that was used to tra translate Barith or covenant um, is dia theke. So dia at the start of, the, um, it's actually a compound word. So dia at the start, it was a proposition word that means through, or walking through. And the second part of this word, seike, it actually has the meaning of a sword. Again, um, a meaning, uh, meaning of cutting. And also, in the covenant-making make, covenant process, it literally involves two parties walking through the pieces, um, the animal pieces, to be, able to, comp to be able to complete a covenant process. So next, um, so making a covenant was actually a common way for Old Testament time during the ancient, um, in the ancient, ancient Near East and also in the Israel um, culture. It's the, it's the most sacred way to form a relationship and also form commitment um, at, during that time. So I'm, now I'm going to take you through seven steps of a typical blood covenant um, ritual. So I don't expect you to remember every single step on this slide, but I hope after my demonstration today, you're able to remember a few key steps and hopefully that would um, reveal a deeper understanding of our relationship with God. So the first step, as you can see on the slide, is exchanging robes. Um, as you probably noticed, robe in the Bible has a bit of meaning or sense of identity or status. We can see from Joseph's story. So when Joseph received a multiple, multiple color robe from his father, his brothers instantly got envious and plotted against him and sold him to slavery. They probably think that um, the robe that Joseph was given was actually identified as um, a right of, like, a, a inheritance, in, inheritance right. Um, and also, in the parable of the prodigal son, um, the son left home and squandered all his inheritance. When he returned home to his father, his father clothed him with his best robe. And that indication is, although the son rebelled against his father, the, um, the father still accept, accept, accept him as his beloved son. In a covenant, covenant making process, I take off my robe and I give my robe to you. 
that is an indication that I'm giving all of me, my being, my inheritance, my identity to you, and the same for you to me. And followed by the next step, which is taking off my belt. That's a bit of a weird one, you might be thinking. Um, but the ancient time, a belt is not only used to tie around your, our clothes, but it's also used to hang our weapons. For example, I would tie, a sword, tie my sword, um, my arrow and my bow on my belt. So by taking off my belt, um, belt and give it to you, I'm actually pledging my support and my protection. So this is trying to say, if you're going into war with someone, you have my full support. I am also going into the same battle to fight against your enemies. And the third step, which is quite a central um, um, element of the whole covenant making process, and I'm gonna use a bit of a prop to demonstrate how this process works. So usually you would take a sacrificial animal, not quite a lion, um, but uh, I'll just, this is the best thing I can find to um, use it for demonstration. And what you will do is you will cut it in half right in the middle. And you would place the two anim animal pieces right um, opposite to each other. And both parties of the covenant making process will have to walk through these animal pieces together. And what this means is I, both parties were, um, were, were dead to ourselves as in we're, um, we're giving up our own rights, we're no longer ourselves, but we are forming a new union until death do us part. And the second meaning for this is, this, I'm, also, um, 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 I'm also making a death uh, blood oath um, um, when I'm looking at these animals. What I'm trying to say is, um, if each party is breaking this covenant, I, um, this is our consequence, will be like the animals over here. So it's also a blood oath. And the fourth step is I will then raise, um, we, will then, we will then raise our right arms and cut our palms and we'll put our palms together and let our blood mix together. So the Israelites actually believe that blood contains life so by mixing our blood together, we're actually mix, mixing our life together. So it's a very strong uni, um, union. Um, and once this scarf, even, um, sorry, once this cut eventually become a scar, it serves a permanent um, reminder of testimony um, and or testimony, sorry, or testimony to the covenant we just made. So next time, when we face our enemies in a battle. All we have to do is raise our arms and show them our scar. This is an indication if you want to fight with me, you will have to also fight with my covenant partner. As we are holding hands and our bloods are, blood are intermingling with each other, we then also exchange our names. I will take your last name and you will take my last name. Again, next time when I go to battle, I, um, call, um, I present my name, you will, ex um, you will instantly know who my alliance is. The sixth step, we then move on to give, um, give our covenant terms. And the typical covenant terms um, are, um, for example, I will give all my possessions and liabilities to you and you to me. So that would include our properties, our money, um, our debt, and also our army as well. Um, and this also means my family is now your family. So if I die in a battle in the future or something, you have to also look after my children and my family. And then we'll have a memorial meal together. So in replace of animal and blood, we will have bread and wine together. Wine is often called as the blood of grapes in the Bible, and it represents our own life. So when we break bread together, and that repre represents our flesh, 
By eating this meal together, we're saying that this is my blood and this is my, fle- this is my body and this is my life. I now put in you. So I am in you and you are in me. We're uh, a new union. And the final element of a covenant making is planting a tree together and sprinkled the tree with the blood of the sacrificial animal. So the blood sprinkled tree together with the sc- and together with the scars in our hand serves as a permanent testimony of the covenant we just made. I'm sure a few of these steps from this covenant making process actually sounds more than familiar. And there are a few examples of the covenant process throughout the Old Testament, such as the treaty that um, that Abraham made with um, Philistine King Abimelech, and also the um, covenant that King David made with Jonathan. But today, I'm actually going to take us to the first covenant that formally established God's relationship with humanity, which is the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis chapter 15 recorded the whole process of God came to Abraham and made a covenant with him. I won't spend too much time reading through the whole chapter, but I'll give you a brief brief summary of the background and read out a few key verses. The word of God came to Abraham in a vision and promised that God will be his shield and will be his great reward. But Abraham questioned God. If God doesn't give him a son, his his blessings will all be in vain because he has no descendants to inherit um, these blessings. Then God promised that he will have his own son and and his descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Abraham questioned again, how can I be sure that I actually will possess it? This is the timing that God initiated a covenant um, cutting process with Abraham. As you can see in verse 9 and 10, um, it says this. So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite to each other. The animals has already been cut. The stage of a covenant um, of a covenant making is set. And in verse twelve, as the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. One thing to note over here is the original Hebrew version of this verse actually said both the sleep and darkness fell onto Abraham. So the indication of this is that God caused Adrian, um, that God caused Abraham to fall into sleep. Not that Abraham, Abraham fell into sleep by himself at this critical timing. God outlines the events. Um, that will take place in his descendants before they take hold of the promised land. Um, And then in verse 17, when the sun has set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed through the pieces. So this fire pot in this verse is actually a visible manifestation of God. In the Old Testament, quite often, God appears to his people in the form of a fire. As we can remember, when God appeared to Moses, it was, um, in the, um, he appeared in the flames of a burning bush. And also when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, and when, God, um, and when they were going through the desert um, t- um, period, God appeared to his people as a pillar of cloud during the day and also a pillar of fire at night. So this fire pot with a blazing torch, it represents God's presence. So God was passing through these animal pieces. And after this, he moved on to give specific geographic details of this promised land to Abraham, which is settling the covenant terms. Does anyone notice that something is missing here? So 
So God put Abraham to sleep, but he never walked through the animal pieces. A lot of the scholars actually believe that God passing through the animal pieces alone means that he was making a unilateral or one-sided, unconditional covenant to Abraham. God binds himself to this covenant and have incurred a blood curse against himself while give Abraham or humanity an out. So if anything happens, if the covenant terms are not fulfilled, God will be punished, but humanity would have been fine. This is really significant. God's covenant with Abraham was subsequently renewed multiple times with his descendants and later on transformed into a new type of covenant when it was renewed with Moses. A type of covenant that usually a king would make with his servants. So the covenant term usually looks like the king will pledge their protection and provision to the servants, where the only thing the servants need to, be, um, uh, need to do to the king is pledging their faithfulness. So the stake for the Israelites to adhere to the covenant term is quite small. They only needed to love the God, your God, um, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. But they did not hold on to their end of the covenant terms. In response, God sent prophets to the Israelites and remind of the covenant that God has made with them and urge them to stay faithful to God. God God also tried corrective plans, including sending the whole chosen nation to exile. But God's purpose of all these corrective plans has always been bringing the Israelites, bringing his people back into into relationship with him again. Although God is fully aware that no one on this earth is capable of holding um, the human human end of the covenant. So similar to how God initiated the Abraham covenant, God also takes the sole initiative to fulfill this covenant. He took our responsibilities onto him and fulfilled them through his one and only son, Jesus. In Galatians 4, um, chapter 4, um, verse 4 to 5. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. The significance of this is, Jesus was, Jesus was not born of the bloodline of Adam. He was free of the original sin. He was conceived by Holy Spirit, born of Virgin Mary, fully God and fully human at the same time. He stayed sin-free and stayed completely faithful to God all the time and fulfilled the human side of the covenant that no one else had, um, had been able to. And because Jesus is fully God, equal to the creator of the universe, He has the right to replace human beings altogether in this fulfillment of covenants. And because he fulfilled the covenant terms for us, we get to live under the new covenant. If we go to the next slide, and let's revisit some of these covenant-making steps. Jesus being the son of God, he exchanged name with us, We can call ourselves Christians, Christ followers, and he took on the name Son of Man, identifying him with all mankind so he can be our intercessor in front of God. The last supper that Jesus had with his disciples was a Passover meal, but it was also a memorial, a covenant, a a memorial meal of a covenant making process. Jesus broke bread and drank wine with his disciples. And Jesus said this, which Rufus already mentioned earlier. 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And do this in, remember, in remembrance of me. After this, after this meal, Jesus went out and planted a memorial tree. It was the cross. He was a sacrifice this time rather than a sacrificial animal. And his blood poured all over the cross. The blood-stained cross stands forever as a memorial to the new covenant that we have through Jesus. Jesus took our robe of self-righteousness, our li liabilities of sins, and our destiny to death. He clothed us with, um, he clothed us with his blood-soaked stripe that offers healing, life, and redemption. He bore our name, which is sinful, unworthy, and unloved on the cross, and he gave us his name, which is worthy and beloved. Jesus has proven that God loves us so much, God thinks that we're worthy enough to sacrifice this one and only son, his one and only son in order to save us. I realized I missed one important thing, so I'm just gonna revisit that concept. So earlier when we were doing the bit of word study, we were talking about the Greek um, word for covenant, um, diatheke. So that word also has another um, English translation, which means testament. Are you making the connection here? So the division or the two parts, um, two names of the two parts of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, is actually a division between the old blood covenant and the new blood covenant that we made with Jesus. So that proves covenant is a central idea to the Bible. Let's now go back to the um, two book-ended verses of the first part of Proverbs that we touched um, on earlier. They indicate that the beginning of wisdom is our relationship with God, and our, our understanding of God will guide us to wise judgment. So this means receiving wisdom is an ongoing process of nurturing our relationship with God. It is a continuous pursuit of understanding more of God. It means lean not on, my, on your own understanding, but submit to Him. Knowing God loves us so much that He sent Jesus to fulfill the covenant that we could never fulfill with our human capacity, so that we can be sin free and be right in front of um, God's eyes again. Knowing all this, Shouldn't we seek more of God and offer ourselves as a living sacrifice and commit to a lifetime of worshiping God? Shouldn't we, in the likeness of Jesus, also become intercessors for people in need and speak on behalf of the voiceless? Shouldn't we try to intimate how God loved us and extend this love to our neighbors. When we disappointed God repeatedly in the past, he never gave up on us. Instead, he gave us a solution and renewed our covenant with him. Shouldn't we also try to be forgiving as God is and not give up on our loved ones just because we have disagreements? Now I would like to invite the band to, um, to join me back up on stage, and I will take the opportunity to share a bit of my personal journey with God, and hopefully that will be a trigger or prompter for you to also reflect your story or your journey with God as well. Um, so I want to share a story of how I came to Australia to start with. Um, it was a wrong starting, starting point. It was a wrong purpose, but God actually turned it, into, turned it around and made it, um, made it into something utterly beautiful. Um, I came to Australia seeking a wrong relationship. Not that it's unethical, it was a relationship um, that didn't work out in the end. Um, um, but I made unwise choices um, during that time. 
And actually, my starting point of believing in God um, intermingled with prayers of um, hoping to make that relationship work, and also prayer to come to Australia to do my study so that I could salvage the messy relationship. God answered my prayer, and my visa, for, uh, my student visa, um, and also my um, um, offer of exception with uni um, was actually ready within a month. I was like, hooray, this is a miracle. Except a week before I flew over to Australia, this guy and I, this guy and I we, ended thing, we ended things permanently. And then I left with a broken heart and lots of questions to God. God, what's the purpose of you asking me to come to Australia then? Little did I know, he has much bigger purpose for me. He called me to Melbourne to embark on a journey of getting to know him more and more and seeking him more and more. I started to go into church every Sunday, started serving, become a, became a leader, even had the courage to tell my family, who are strong atheists, um, who got mad at the start when they found out I believe in, in God. Um, but I finally found courage to tell them that I have faith in God. And what they came back to me was a miracle. They said, we realize the difference in you, and we're happy that you found a face um, that's making you a better person. Subsequently, I also found the com confidence in God and stepped into Bible college. It was a miracle to start with because I received that prompting or calling while I was sitting in a sermon. When the preacher was talking about that miracle would only happen in impossible situations. And that to me was back Bible college back then. Because imagine like 15 years ago, I couldn't even form English sen sentences flu fluently. Um, and sitting in a room and then everyone's learning about God and potentially the opportunities of presenting a message about God on stage. This is all miracle. This was all impossible. Um, and also last year, I received a vision from Janine when she was drawing a picture for me and, and put into the partnership um, folder for me. She drew um, an ocean and it was a dolphin that's going, um, or a whale that's um, going deep into the ocean. And that was a message for me to continue to perceive, um, con con continue to pursue it and go deeper with God. And look what have come so far within this one year, <laughs> being able to stand over here and share a message of God. I'm just, when, whenever I look back and reflect on the miracles or the things that God has presented in front of me, um, I always um, just find <laughs> I'm speechless. God is so faithful um, that I can only respond with my continu continuous pursuit of who He is and this ongoing relationship with Him. So now I invite you to, also, as we go into a bit of extended worship, uh, and I'm going to put the, de uh, the team on the spot. Can we go back to the bridge of ocean a bit before going into Worthy? <laughs> um, I invite you to also think about the testimonies that you received from God and all those moments have aligned your journey with God so far that God is calling you to step on waters, step into impossible situations for Him and leading into, um, into you to leading you to a space where only faith can sustain you.